Chapter Twelve of The New Magdalene. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The New Magdalene by Wilkie Collins. Chapter Twelve. Exit Julian. Julian happened to be standing nearest to Mercy. He was the first at her side when she fell. In the cry of alarm which burst from him as he raised her for a moment in his arms, in the expression of his eyes when he looked at her death-like face, there escaped the plain, too plain, confession of the interest which he felt in her, of the admiration which she had aroused in him. Horace detected it. There was the quick suspicion of jealousy in the movement by which he joined Julian. There was the ready resentment of jealousy in the tone in which he pronounced the words, Leave her to me. Julian resigned her in silence. A faint flush appeared on his pale face as he drew back while Horace carried her to the sofa. His eyes sunk to the ground. He seemed to be meditating, self-reproachfully, on the tone in which his friend had spoken to him. After having been the first to take an active part in meeting the calamity that had happened, he was now, to all appearance, insensible to everything that was passing in the room. A touch on his shoulder roused him. He turned and looked round. The woman who had done the mischief the stranger in the poor black garments, was standing behind him. She pointed to the prostrate figure on the sofa with a merciless smile. "'You wanted a proof just now,' she said. "'There it is.' Horace heard her. He suddenly left the sofa and joined Julian. His face, naturally ruddy, was pale with suppressed fury. "'Take that wretch away,' he said. "'Instantly.' or I won't answer for what I may do. Those words recalled Julian to himself. He looked round the room. Lady Janet and the housekeeper were together, in attendance on the swooning woman. The startled servants were congregated in the library doorway. One of them offered to run to the nearest doctor. Another asked if he should fetch the police. Julian silenced them by a gesture and turned to Horace. Compose yourself, he said. Leave me to remove her quietly from the house. He took Grace by the hand as he spoke. She hesitated and tried to release herself. Julian pointed to the group at the sofa and to the servants looking on. You have made an enemy of everyone in this room, he said, and you have not a friend in London. Do you wish to make an enemy of me? Her head drooped. She made no reply. She waited, dumbly obedient, to the firmer will than her own. Julian ordered the servants crowding together in the doorway to withdraw. He followed them into the library, leading Grace after him by the hand. Before closing the door he paused and looked back into the dining room. "'Is she recovering?' he asked, after a moment's hesitation. Lady Janet's voice answered him, "'Not yet.' "'Shall I send for the nearest doctor?' Horace interposed. He declined to let Julian associate himself, even in that indirect manner, with Mercy's recovery. "'If the doctor is wanted,' he said, "'I will go for him myself.' Julian closed the library door. He absently released Grace. He mechanically pointed to a chair. She sat down in silent surprise following him with her eyes as he walked slowly to and fro in the room. For the moment his mind was far away from her and from all that had happened since her appearance in the house. It was impossible that a man of his fineness of perception could mistake the meaning of Horace's conduct toward him. He was questioning his own heart on the subject of mercy, sternly and unreservedly, as it was his habit to do. After only once seeing her, he thought, has she produced such an impression on me that Horace can discover it, before I have even suspected it myself? 
can the time have come already when i owe it to my friend to see her no more he stopped irritably in his walk as a man devoted to a serious calling in life there was something that wounded his self-respect in the bare suspicion that he could be guilty of the purely sentimental extravagance called love at first sight he had paused exactly opposite to the chair in which grace was seated weary of the silence she seized the opportunity of speaking to him i have come here with you as you wished she said are you going to help me am i to count on you as my friend he looked at her vacantly it cost him an effort before he could give her the attention that she had claimed you have been hard on me grace went on but you showed me some kindness at first you tried to make them give me a fair hearing i ask you as a just man do you doubt now that the woman on the sofa in the next room is an impostor who has taken my place can there be any plainer confession that she is mercy merrick than the confession she has made you saw it they saw it she fainted at the sight of me julian crossed the room still without answering her and rang the bell when the servant appeared he told the man to fetch a cab grace rose from her chair what is the cab for she asked sharply for you and for me julian replied i am going to take you back to your lodgings i refuse to go my place is in this house neither lady janet nor you can get over the plain facts all i asked was to be confronted with her and what did she do when she came into the room she fainted at the sight of me reiterating her one triumphant assertion she fixed her eyes on julian with a look which said plainly answer that if you can in mercy to her julian answered it on the spot as far as i understand he said you appear to take it for granted that no innocent woman would have fainted on first seeing you i have something to tell you which will alter your opinion on her arrival in england this lady informed my aunt that she had met with you accidentally on the french frontier and that she had seen you so far as she knew struck dead at her side by a shell remember that and recall what happened just now without a word to warn her of your restoration to life she finds herself suddenly face to face with you a living woman and this at a time when it is easy for any one who looks at her to see that she is in a delicate health what is there wonderful what is there unaccountable in her fainting under such circumstances as these the question was plainly put where was the answer to it there was no answer to it mercy's wisely candid statement of the manner in which she had first met with grace and of the accident which had followed had served mercy's purpose but too well it was simply impossible for persons acquainted with that statement to attach a guilty meaning to the swoon the false grace roseberry was still as far beyond the reach of suspicion as ever and the true grace was quick enough to see it she sank into the chair from which she had risen her hands fell in hopeless despair on her lap everything is against me she said the truth itself turns liar and takes her side she paused and rallied her sinking courage no she cried resolutely i won't submit to have my name and my place taken from me by a vile adventuress say what you like i insist on exposing her i won't leave the house the servant entered the room and announced that the cab was at the door grace turned to julian with a defiant wave of her hand don't let me detain you she said i see i have neither advice nor help to expect from mr julian gray julian beckoned to the servant to follow him into a corner of the room do you know if the doctor has been sent for he asked i believe not sir it is said in the servants hall that the doctor is not wanted julian was too anxious to be satisfied 
with a report from the servants hall he hastily wrote on a slip of paper has she recovered and gave the note to the man with directions to take it to lady janet did you hear what i said grace inquired while the messenger was absent in the dining-room i will answer you directly said julian the servant appeared again as he spoke with some lines in pencil written by lady janet on the back of julian's note thank god we have revived her in a few minutes we hope to be able to take her to her room the nearest way to mercy's room was through the library grace's immediate removal had now become a necessity which was not to be trifled with julian addressed himself to meeting the difficulty the instant he was left alone with grace listen to me he said the cab is waiting and i have my last words to say to you you are now thanks to the consul's recommendation in my care decide at once whether you will remain under my charge or whether you will transfer yourself to the charge of the police grace started what do you mean she asked angrily if you wish to remain under my charge julian proceeded you will accompany me at once to the cab in that case i will undertake to give you an opportunity of telling your story to my own lawyer he will be a fitter person to advise you than i am nothing will induce me to believe that the lady whom you have accused has committed or is capable of committing such a fraud as you charge her with you will hear what the lawyer thinks if you come with me if you refuse i shall have no choice but to send into the next room and tell them that you are still here the result will be that you will find yourself in charge of the police take which course you like i will give you a minute to decide in and remember this if i appear to express myself harshly it is your conduct which forces me to speak out i mean kindly toward you i am advising you honestly for your good he took out his watch to count the minute grace stole one furtive glance at his steady resolute face she was perfectly unmoved by the manly consideration for her which julian's last words had expressed all she understood was that he was not a man to be trifled with future opportunities would offer themselves of returning secretly to the house she determined to yield and deceive him i am ready to go she said rising with dogged submission your turn now she muttered to herself as she turned to the looking-glass to arrange her shawl my turn will come julian advanced toward her as if to offer her his arm and checked himself firmly persuaded as he was that her mind was deranged readily as he admitted that she claimed in virtue of her affliction every indulgence that he could extend to her there was something repellent to him at that moment in the bare idea of touching her the image of the beautiful creature who was the object of her monstrous accusation the image of mercy as she lay helpless for a moment in his arms was vivid in his mind while he opened the door that led into the hall and drew back to let grace pass out before him he left the servant to help her into the cab the man respectfully addressed him as he took his seat opposite to grace i am ordered to say that your room is ready sir and that her ladyship expects you to dinner absorbed in the events which had followed his aunt's invitation julian had forgotten his engagement to stay at mablethorpe house could he return knowing his own heart as he now knew it could he honourably remain perhaps for weeks together in mercy's society conscious as he now was of the impression which she had produced on him no the one honourable course that he could take was to find an excuse for withdrawing from his engagement beg her ladyship not to wait dinner for me he said i will write and make my apologies the cab drove off the wondering servant waited on the doorstep looking after it i wouldn't stand in mr julian's shoes for something he thought with his mind running on the difficulties of the young clergyman's position there she is along with him in the cab what is he going to do with her after that julian himself if it had been put to him at the moment 
could not have answered the question lady janet's anxiety was far from being relieved when mercy had been restored to her senses and conducted to her own room mercy's mind remained in a condition of unreasoning alarm which it was impossible to remove over and over again she was told that the woman who had terrified her had left the house and would never be permitted to enter it more over and over again she was assured that the stranger's frantic assertions were regarded by everybody about her as unworthy of a moment's serious attention she persisted in doubting whether they were telling her the truth a shocking distrust of her friends seemed to possess her she shrunk when lady janet approached the bedside she shuddered when lady janet kissed her she flatly refused to let horace see her she asked the strangest questions about julian gray and shook her head suspiciously when they told her that he was absent from the house at intervals she hid her face in the bedclothes and murmured to herself piteously oh what shall i do what shall i do at other times her one petition was to be left alone i want nobody in my room that was her sullen cry nobody in my room the evening advanced and brought with it no change for the better lady janet by the advice of horace sent for her own medical adviser the doctor shook his head the symptoms he said indicated a serious shock to the nervous system he wrote a sedative prescription and he gave with a happy choice of language some sound and safe advice it amounted briefly to this take her away and try the seaside lady janet's customary energy acted on the advice without a moment's needless delay she gave the necessary directions for packing the trunks overnight and decided on leaving mablethorpe house with mercy the next morning shortly after the doctor had taken his departure a letter from julian addressed to lady janet was delivered by private messenger beginning with the necessary apologies for the writer's absence the letter proceeded in these terms before i permitted my companion to see the lawyer i felt the necessity of consulting him as to my present position toward her first i told him what i think it only right to repeat to you that i do not feel justified in acting on my own opinion that her mind is deranged in the case of this friendless woman i want medical authority and more even than that i want some positive proof to satisfy my conscience as well as to confirm my view finding me obstinate on this point the lawyer undertook to consult a physician accustomed to the treatment of the insane on my behalf after sending a message and receiving the answer he said bring the lady here in half an hour she shall tell her story to the doctor instead of telling it to me the proposal rather staggered me i asked how it was possible to induce her to do that he laughed and answered i shall present the doctor as my senior partner my senior partner will be the very man to advise her you know that i hate all deception even where the end in view appears to justify it on this occasion however there was no other alternative than to let the lawyer take his own course or to run the risk of a delay which might be followed by serious results i waited in a room by myself feeling very uneasy i own until the doctor joined me after the interview was over his opinion is briefly this after careful examination of the unfortunate creature he thinks that there are unmistakably symptoms of mental aberration but how far the mischief has gone and whether her case is or is not sufficiently grave to render actual restraint necessary he cannot positively say in our present state of ignorance as to facts thus far he observed we know nothing of that part of her delusion which relates to mercy merrick the solution of the difficulty in this case is to be found there i entirely agree with the lady that the inquiries of the consul at mannheim are far from being conclusive furnish me with satisfactory evidence either that there is or is not such a person really in existence as mercy merrick and i will give you a positive opinion 
on the case whenever you choose to ask for it those words have decided me on starting for the continent and renewing the search for mercy merrick my friend the lawyer wonders jocosely whether i am in my right senses his advice is that i should apply to the nearest magistrate and relieve you and myself of all further trouble in that way perhaps you agree with him my dear aunt as you have often said i do nothing like other people i am interested in this case i cannot abandon a forlorn woman who has been confided to me to the tender mercies of strangers so long as there is any hope of my making discoveries which may be instrumental in restoring her to herself perhaps also in restoring her to her friends i start by the mail train of to-night my plan is to go first to mannheim and consult with the consul and the hospital doctors then to find my way to the german surgeon and to question him and that done to make the last and hardest effort of all the effort to trace the french ambulance and to penetrate the mystery of mercy merrick immediately on my return i will wait on you and tell you what i have accomplished or how i have failed in the meanwhile pray be under no alarm about the reappearance of this unhappy woman at your house she is fully occupied in writing at my suggestion to her friends in canada and she is under the care of the landlady at her lodgings an experienced and trustworthy person who has satisfied the doctor as well as myself of her fitness for the charge that she has undertaken pray mention this to miss roseberry whenever you think it desirable with the respectful expression of my sympathy and of my best wishes for her speedy restoration to health and once more forgive me for failing under stress of necessity to enjoy the hospitality of mablethorpe house lady janet closed julian's letter feeling far from satisfied with it she sat for a while pondering over what her nephew had written to her one of two things thought the quick-witted old lady either the lawyer is right and julian is a fit companion for the mad woman whom he has taken under his charge or he has some second motive for this absurd journey of his which he has carefully abstained from mentioning in his letter what can the motive be at intervals during the night that question recurred to her ladyship again and again the utmost exercise of her ingenuity failing to answer it her one resource left was to wait patiently for julian's return and in her own favorite phrase to have it out of him then the next morning lady janet and her adopted daughter left mablethorpe house for brighton horace who had begged to be allowed to accompany them being sentenced to remain in london by mercy's expressed desire why nobody could guess and mercy refused to say End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of the new magdalen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the new magdalen by wilkie collins chapter thirteen enter julian a week has passed the scene opens again in the dining-room at mablethorpe house the hospitable table bears once more its burden of good things for lunch but on this occasion lady janet sits alone her attention is divided between reading her newspaper and feeding her cat the cat is a sleek and splendid creature he carries an erect tail he rolls luxuriously on the soft carpet he approaches his mistress in a series of coquettish curves he smells with dainty hesitation at the choicest morsels that can be offered to him the musical monotony of his purring falls soothingly on her ladyship's ear she stops in the middle of a leading article and looks with a careworn face at the happy cat upon my honour cries lady janet thinking in her inveterately ironical manner of the cares that trouble her all things considered tom i wish i was you 
the cat starts not at his mistress's complimentary apostrophe but at a knock at the door which follows close upon it lady janet says carelessly enough come in looks round listlessly to see who it is and starts like the cat when the door opens and discloses julian gray you or your ghost she exclaims she has noticed already that julian is paler than usual and that there is something in his manner at once uneasy and subdued highly uncharacteristic of him at other times he takes a seat by her side and kisses her hand but for the first time in his aunt's experience of him he refuses the good things on the luncheon table and has nothing to say to the cat that neglected animal takes refuge on lady janet's lap lady janet with her eyes fixed expectantly on her nephew determining to have it out of him at the first opportunity waits to hear what he has to say for himself julian has no alternative but to break the silence and tell his story as he best may i got back from the continent last night he began and i come here as i promised to report myself on my return how does your ladyship do how is miss roseberry lady janet laid an indicative finger on the lace pelerin which ornamented the upper part of her dress here is the old lady well she answered and pointed next to the room above them and there she added is the young lady ill is anything the matter with you julian perhaps i am a little tired after my journey never mind me is miss roseberry still suffering from the shock what else should she be suffering from i will never forgive you julian for bringing that crazy impostor into my house my dear aunt when i was the innocent means of bringing her here i had no idea that such a person as miss roseberry was in existence nobody laments what has happened more sincerely than i do have you had medical advice i took her to the seaside a week since by medical advice has the change of air done her no good none whatever if anything the change of air has made her worse sometimes she sits for hours together as pale as death without looking at anything and without uttering a word sometimes she brightens up and seems as if she was eager to say something and then heaven only knows why checks herself suddenly as if she was afraid to speak i could support that but what cuts me to the heart julian is that she does not appear to trust me and to love me as she did she seems to be doubtful of me she seems to be frightened of me if i did not know that it was simply impossible that such a thing could be i should really think she suspected me of believing what that wretch said of her in one word and between ourselves i begin to fear she will never get over the fright which caused that fainting fit there is serious mischief somewhere and try as i may to discover it it is mischief beyond my finding can the doctor do nothing lady janet's bright black eyes answered before she replied in words with a look of supreme contempt the doctor she repeated disdainfully i brought grace back last night in sheer despair and i sent for the doctor this morning he is at the head of his profession he is said to be making ten thousand a year and he knows no more about it than i do i am quite serious the great physician has just gone away with two guineas in his pocket one guinea for advising me to keep her quiet another guinea for telling me to trust to time do you wonder how he gets on at this rate my dear boy they all get on in the same way the medical profession thrives on two incurable diseases in these modern days a he disease and a she disease she disease nervous depression he disease suppressed gout remedies one guinea if you go to the doctor two guineas if the doctor goes to you i might have bought a new bonnet cried her ladyship indignantly with the money i have given to that man let us change the subject i lose my temper when i think of it besides i want to know something why did you go abroad 
at that plain question julian looked unaffectedly surprised i wrote to explain he said have you not received my letter oh i got your letter it was long enough in all conscience and long as it was it didn't tell me the one thing i wanted to know what is the one thing lady janet's reply pointed not too palpably at first at that second motive for julian's journey which she had suspected julian of concealing from her i want to know she said why you troubled yourself to make your inquiries on the continent in person you know where my old courier is to be found you have yourself pronounced him to be the most intelligent and trustworthy of men answer me honestly could you not have sent him in your place i might have sent him julian admitted a little reluctantly you might have sent the courier and you were under an engagement to stay here as my guest answer me honestly once more why did you go away julian hesitated lady janet paused for his reply with the air of a woman who was prepared to wait if necessary for the rest of the afternoon i had a reason of my own for going julian said at last yes rejoined lady janet prepared to wait if necessary till the next morning a reason julian resumed which i would rather not mention oh said lady janet another mystery eh and another woman at the bottom of it no doubt thank you that will do i am sufficiently answered no wonder as a clergyman that you look a little confused there is perhaps a certain grace under the circumstances in looking confused we will change the subject again you stay here of course now that you have come back once more the famous pulpit orator seemed to find himself in the inconceivable predicament of not knowing what to say once more lady janet looked resigned to wait if necessary until the middle of next week julian took refuge in an answer worthy of the most commonplace man on the face of the civilized earth i beg your ladyship to accept my thanks and my excuses he said lady janet's many ringed fingers mechanically stroking the cat in her lap began to stroke him the wrong way lady janet's inexhaustible patience showed signs of failing her at last mighty civil i am sure she said make it complete say mr julian gray presents his compliments to lady janet roy and regrets that a previous engagement julian exclaimed the old lady suddenly pushing the cat off her lap and flinging her last pretense of good temper to the winds julian i am not to be trifled with there is but one explanation of your conduct you are evidently avoiding my house is there somebody you dislike in it is it me julian intimated by a gesture that his aunt's last question was absurd the much injured cat elevated his back waved his tail slowly walked to the fireplace and honored the rug by taking a seat on it lady janet persisted is it grace roseberry she asked next even julian's patience began to show signs of yielding his manner assumed a sudden decision his voice rose a tone louder you insist on knowing he said it is miss roseberry you don't like her cried lady janet with a sudden burst of angry surprise julian broke out on his side if i see any more of her he answered the rare color mounting passionately in his cheeks i shall be the unhappiest man living if i see any more of her i shall be false to my old friend who is to marry her keep us apart if you have any regard for my peace of mind keep us apart unutterable amazement expressed itself in his aunt's lifted hands ungovernable curiosity uttered itself in his aunt's next words you don't mean to tell me you are in love with grace julian sprung restlessly to his feet and disturbed the cat at the fireplace the cat left the room i don't know what to tell you he said i can't realize it to myself no other woman has ever roused the feeling in me which this woman seems to have called to life in an instant in the hope of forgetting her i broke my engagement here 
I purposely seized the opportunity of making those inquiries abroad. Quite useless. I think of her morning, noon, and night. I see her and hear her at this moment as plainly as I see and hear you. She has made herself a part of myself. I don't understand my life without her. My power of will seems to be gone. I said to myself this morning, I will write to my aunt. I won't go back to Mablethorpe House. Here I am in Mablethorpe House, with a mean subterfuge to justify me to my own conscience. I owe it to my aunt to call on my aunt. That is what I said to myself on the way here. And I was secretly hoping every step of the way that she would come into the room when I got here. I am hoping it now. And she is engaged to Horace Holmcroft, to my oldest friend, to my best friend. Am I an infernal rascal? Or am I a weak fool? God knows. I don't. Keep my secret, aunt. I am heartily ashamed of myself. I used to think I was made of better stuff than this. Don't say a word to Horace. I must and will conquer it. Let me go. He snatched up his hat. Lady Janet, rising with the activity of a young woman, pursued him across the room and stopped him at the door. No, answered the resolute old lady. I won't let you go. Come back with me. As she said those words, she noticed with a certain fond pride the brilliant color mounting in his cheeks, the flashing brightness which lent an added luster to his eyes. He had never, to her mind, looked so handsome before. She took his arm and led him to the chairs which they had just left. It was shocking. It was wrong, she mentally admitted, to look on Mercy under the circumstances with any other eye than the eye of a brother or a friend in a clergyman perhaps doubly shocking doubly wrong but with all her respect for the vested interests of horace lady janet could not blame julian worse still she was privately conscious that he had somehow or other risen rather than fallen in her estimation within the last minute or two who could deny that her adopted daughter was a charming creature? Who could wonder if a man of refined tastes admired her? Upon the whole, her ladyship humanely decided that her nephew was rather to be pitied than blamed. What daughter of Eve, no matter whether she was seventeen or seventy, could have honestly arrived at any other conclusion? Do what a man may, let him commit anything he likes from an error to a crime. So long as there is a woman at the bottom of it, there is an inexhaustible fund of pardon for him in every other woman's heart. Sit down, said Lady Janet, smiling in spite of herself, and don't talk in that horrible way again. A man, Julian, especially a famous man like you, ought to know how to control himself. Julian burst out laughing bitterly. "'Send upstairs for my self-control,' he said. "'It's in her possession, not in mine. "'Good morning, aunt.' He rose from his chair. Lady Janet instantly pushed him back into it. "'I insist on your staying here,' she said. "'If it is only for a few minutes longer, I have something to say to you.' "'Does it refer to Miss Roseberry?' "'It refers to the hateful woman who frightened Miss Roseberry. "'Now are you satisfied?' Julian bowed and settled himself in his chair. "'I don't much like to acknowledge it,' his aunt went on, "'but I want you to understand that I have something really serious to speak about, for once in a way. "'Julian, that wretch not only frightens Grace, she actually frightens me. "'Frightens you? She is quite harmless, poor thing.' "'Poor thing?' repeated Lady Janet. "'Did you say poor thing?' "'Yes.' Is it possible that you pity her? From the bottom of my heart. The old lady's temper gave way again at that reply. I hate a man who can't hate anybody, she burst out. If you had been an ancient Roman, Julian, I believe you would have pitied Nero himself. Julian cordially agreed with her. I believe I should, he said quietly. All sinners, my dear aunt, are more or less miserable sinners. Nero must have been one of the wretchedest of mankind. Wretched, exclaimed Lady Janet. Nero wretched? A man who committed robbery, 
arson and murder to his own violin accompaniment only wretched what next i wonder when modern philanthropy begins to apologize for nero modern philanthropy has arrived at a pretty pass indeed we shall hear next that bloody queen mary was as playful as a kitten and if poor dear henry the eighth carried anything to an extreme it was the practice of the domestic virtues ah how i hate cant what were we talking about just now you wander from the subject julian you are what i call bird-witted i protest i forget what i wanted to say to you no i won't be reminded of it i may be an old woman but i am not in my dotage yet why do you sit there staring have you nothing to say for yourself of all the people in the world have you lost the use of your tongue julian's excellent temper and accurate knowledge of his aunt's character exactly fitted him to calm the rising storm he contrived to lead lady janet insensibly back to the lost subject by dexterous reference to a narrative which he had thus far left untold the narrative of his adventures on the continent i have a great deal to say aunt he replied i have not yet told you of my discoveries abroad lady janet instantly took the bait i knew there was something forgotten she said you have been all this time in the house and you have told me nothing begin directly patient julian began End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the new magdalen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the new magdalen by wilkie collins chapter fourteen coming events cast their shadows before i went first to mannheim lady janet as i told you i should in my letter and i heard all that the consul and the hospital doctors could tell me no new fact of the slightest importance turned up i got my directions for finding the german surgeon and i set forth to try what i could make next of the man who performed the operation on the question of his patient's identity he had as a perfect stranger to her nothing to tell me on the question of her mental condition however he made a very important statement he owned to me that he had operated on another person injured by a shell wound on the head at the battle of solferino and that the patient recovering also in this case recovered mad that is a remarkable admission don't you think so lady janet's temper had hardly been allowed time enough to subside to its customary level very remarkable i dare say she answered to people who feel any doubt of this pitiable lady of yours being mad i feel no doubt and thus far i find your account of yourself julian tiresome in the extreme go on to the end did you lay your hand on mercy merrick no did you hear anything of her nothing difficulties beset me on every side the french ambulance had shared in the disasters of france it was broken up the wounded frenchmen were prisoners somewhere in germany nobody knew where the french surgeon had been killed in action his assistants were scattered most likely in hiding i began to despair of making any discovery when accident threw in my way two prussian soldiers who had been in the french cottage they confirmed what the german surgeon told the consul and what horace himself told me namely that no nurse in a black dress was to be seen in the place if there had been such a person she would certainly the prussians inform me have been found in attendance on the injured frenchmen the cross of the geneva convention would have been amply sufficient to protect her no woman wearing that badge of honor would have disgraced herself by abandoning the wounded men before the germans entered the place in short interposed lady janet there is no such person as mercy merrick 
i can draw no other conclusion said julian unless the english doctor's idea is the right one after hearing what i have just told you he thinks the woman herself is mercy merrick lady janet held up her hand as a sign that she had an objection to make here you and the doctor seem to have settled everything to your entire satisfaction on both sides she said but there is one difficulty that you have neither of you accounted for yet what is it aunt you talk glibly enough julian about this woman's mad assertion that grace is the missing nurse and that she is grace but you have not explained yet how the idea first got into her head and more than that how it is that she is acquainted with my name and address and perfectly familiar with grace's papers and grace's affairs these things are a puzzle to a person of my average intelligence can your clever mind the doctor account for them shall i tell you what he said when i saw him this morning will it take long it will take about a minute you agreeably surprise me go on you want to know how she gained her knowledge of your name and of miss roseberry's affairs julian resumed the doctor says in one of two ways either miss roseberry must have spoken of you and of her own affairs while she and the stranger were together in the french cottage or the stranger must have obtained access privately to miss roseberry's papers do you agree so far lady janet began to feel interested for the first time perfectly she said i have no doubt grace rashly talked of matters which an older and wiser person would have kept to herself very good do you also agree that the last idea in the woman's mind when she was struck by the shell might have been quite probably the idea of miss roseberry's identity and miss roseberry's affairs you think it likely enough well what happens after that the wounded woman is brought to life by an operation and she becomes delirious in the hospital at mannheim during her delirium the idea of miss roseberry's identity ferments in her brain and assumes its present perverted form in that form it still remains as a necessary consequence she persists in reversing the two identities she says she is miss roseberry and declares miss roseberry to be mercy merrick there is the doctor's explanation what do you think of it very ingenious i dare say the doctor doesn't quite satisfy me however for all that i think what lady janet thought was not destined to be expressed she suddenly checked herself and held up her hand for the second time another objection inquired julian hold your tongue cried the old lady if you say a word more i shall lose it again lose what aunt what i wanted to say to you ages ago i have got it back again it begins with a question no more of the doctor i have had enough of him where is she your pitiable lady my crazy wretch where is she now still in london yes and still at large still with the landlady at her lodgings very well now answer me this what is to prevent her from making another attempt to force her way or steal her way into my house how am i to protect grace how am i to protect myself if she comes here again is that really what you wish to speak to me about that and nothing else they were both too deeply interested in the subject of their conversation to look toward the conservatory and to notice the appearance at that moment of a distant gentleman among the plants and flowers who had made his way in from the garden outside advancing noiselessly on the soft indian matting the gentleman ere long revealed himself under the form and features of horace holmcroft before entering the dining-room he paused fixing his eyes inquisitively on the back of lady janet's visitor the back being all that he could see in the position he then occupied after a pause of an instant the visitor spoke and further uncertainty was at once at an end horace nevertheless made no movement to enter the room he had his own jealous distrust of what 
julian might be tempted to say at a private interview with his aunt and he wanted a little longer on the chance that his doubts might be verified neither you nor miss roseberry need any protection from the poor deluded creature julian went on i have gained great influence over her and i have satisfied her that it is useless to present herself here again i beg your pardon interposed horace speaking from the conservatory door you have done nothing of the sort he had heard enough to satisfy him that the talk was not taking the direction which his suspicions had anticipated and as an additional incentive to show himself a happy chance had now offered him the opportunity of putting julian in the wrong good heavens horace exclaimed lady janet where did you come from and what do you mean i heard at the lodge that your ladyship and grace had returned last night and i came in at once without troubling the servants by the shortest way he turned to julian next the woman you were speaking of just now he proceeded has been here again already in lady janet's absence lady janet immediately looked at her nephew julian reassured her by a gesture impossible he said there must be some mistake there is no mistake horace rejoined i am repeating what i have just heard from the lodge-keeper himself he hesitated to mention it to lady janet for fear of alarming her only three days since this person had the audacity to ask him for her ladyship's address at the seaside of course he refused to give it you hear that julian said lady janet no signs of anger or mortification escaped julian the expression in his face at that moment was an expression of sincere distress pray don't alarm yourself he said to his aunt in his quietest tones if she attempts to annoy you or miss roseberry again i have it in my power to stop her instantly how asked lady janet how indeed echoed horace if we give her in charge to the police we shall become the subject of a public scandal i have managed to avoid all danger of scandal julian answered the expression of distress in his face becoming more and more marked while he spoke before i called here to-day i had a private consultation with the magistrate of the district and i have made certain arrangements at the police station close by on receipt of my card an experienced man in plain clothes will present himself at any address that i indicate and will take her quietly away the magistrate will hear the charge in his private room and will examine the evidence which i can produce showing that she is not accountable for her actions the proper medical officer will report officially on the case and the law will place her under the necessary restraint lady janet and horace looked at each other in amazement julian was in their opinion the last man on earth to take the course at once sensible and severe which julian had actually adopted lady janet insisted on an explanation why do i hear of this now for the first time she asked why did you not tell me you had taken these precautions before julian answered frankly and sadly because i hoped aunt that there would be no necessity for proceeding to extremities you now force me to acknowledge that the lawyer and the doctor both of whom i have seen this morning think as you do that she is not to be trusted it was at their suggestion entirely that i went to the magistrate they put it to me whether the result of my inquiries abroad unsatisfactory as it may have been in other respects did not strengthen the conclusion that the poor woman's mind is deranged i felt compelled in common honesty to admit that it was so having owned this i was bound to take such precautions as the lawyer and the doctor thought necessary i have done my duty sorely against my own will it is weak of me i dare say but i cannot bear the thought of treating this afflicted creature harshly her delusion is so hopeless her situation is such a pitiable one his voice faltered he turned away abruptly and took up his hat lady janet followed him and spoke to him at the door horace smiled satirically and went to warm himself at the fire are you going away julian 
I am only going to the lodge keeper. I want to give him a word of warning in case of his seeing her again. You will come back here? Lady Janet lowered her voice to a whisper. There is really a reason, Julian, for your not leaving the house now. I promise not to go away, aunt, until I have provided for your security. If you or your adopted daughter are alarmed by another intrusion, I give you my word of honor my card shall go to the police station. However, painfully, I may feel it myself. He, too, lowered his voice at the next words. In the meantime, remember what I confessed to you while we were alone. For my sake, let me see as little of Miss Roseberry as possible. Shall I find you in this room when I come back? Yes. Alone? He laid a strong emphasis, of look as well as of tone, on that one word. Lady Janet understood what the emphasis meant. Are you really, she whispered, as much in love with Grace as that? Julian laid one hand on his aunt's arm and pointed with the other to Horace, standing with his back to them, warming his feet on the fender. Well, said Lady Janet. Well, said Julian, with a smile on his lip and a tear in his eye, I never envied any man as I envy him. With those words, he left the room. End of chapter 14《Chapter 15 of The New Magdalen》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. • The New Magdalen » by Wilkie Collins • Chapter 15 • A Woman's Remorse Having warmed his feet to his own entire satisfaction, Horace turned round from the fireplace and discovered that he and Lady Janet were alone. "'Can I see Grace?' he asked. The easy tone in which he put the question, a tone, as it were, of proprietorship in Grace, jarred on Lady Janet at the moment. For the first time in her life she found herself comparing Horace with Julian, to Horace's disadvantage. He was rich. He was a gentleman of ancient lineage. He bore an unblemished character. But who had the strong brain? Who had the great heart?' which was the man of the two. "'Nobody can see her,' answered Lady Janet. "'Not even you.' The tone of the reply was sharp, with a dash of irony in it. But where is the modern young man, possessed of health and an independent income, who is capable of understanding that irony can be presumptuous enough to address itself to him? Horace, with perfect politeness, declined to consider himself answered. "'Does your ladyship mean that Miss Roseberry is in bed?' he asked. "'I mean that Miss Roseberry is in her room. "'I mean that I have twice tried to persuade Miss Roseberry to dress, "'and come downstairs, and tried in vain. "'I mean that what Miss Roseberry refuses to do for me "'she is not likely to do for you. "'How many more meanings of her own Lady Janet might have gone on enumerating it is not easy to calculate. At her third sentence, a sound in the library caught her ear through the incompletely closed door, and suspended the next words on her lips. Horace heard it also. It was the rustling sound traveling nearer and nearer over the library carpet of a silken dress. In the interval while a coming event remains in a state of uncertainty, what is it the inevitable tendency of every Englishman under thirty to do? His inevitable tendency is to ask somebody to bet on the event. He can no more resist it than he can resist lifting his stick or his umbrella in the absence of a gun and pretending to shoot if a bird flies by him while he is out for a walk. What will your ladyship bet that this is not grace? cried Horace. Her ladyship took no notice of the proposal. Her attention remained fixed on the library door. The rustling sound stopped for a moment. The door was softly pushed open. The false Grace Roseberry entered the room. Horace advanced to meet her, opened his lips to speak, and stopped, struck dumb by the change in his affianced wife since he had seen her last. Some terrible oppression 
seemed to have crushed her it was as if she had actually shrunk in height as well as in substance she walked more slowly than usual she spoke more rarely than usual and in a lower tone to those who had seen her before the fatal visit of the stranger from mannheim it was the wreck of the woman that now appeared instead of the woman herself and yet there was the old charm still surviving through it all the grandeur of the head and eyes the delicate symmetry of the features the unsought grace of every movement in a word the unconquerable beauty which suffering cannot destroy and which time itself is powerless to wear out lady janet advanced and took her with hearty kindness by both hands my dear child welcome among us again you have come downstairs to please me she bent her head in silent acknowledgment that it was so lady janet pointed to horace here is somebody who has been longing to see you grace she never looked up she stood submissive her eyes fixed on a little basket of coloured wools which hung on her arm thank you lady janet she said faintly thank you horace horace placed her arm in his and led her to the sofa she shivered as she took her seat and looked around her it was the first time she had seen the dining-room since the day when she had found herself face to face with the dead alive why do you come here my love asked lady janet the drawing-room would have been a warmer and a pleasanter place for you i saw a carriage at the front door i was afraid of meeting with visitors in the drawing-room as she made that reply the servant came in and announced the visitor's names lady janet sighed wearily i must go and get rid of them she said resigning herself to circumstances what will you do grace i will stay here if you please i will keep her company added horace lady janet hesitated she had promised to see her nephew in the dining-room on his return to the house and to see him alone would there be time enough to get rid of the visitors and to establish her adopted daughter in the empty drawing-room before julian appeared it was ten minutes walk to the lodge and he had to make the gatekeeper understand his instructions lady janet decided that she had time enough at her disposal she nodded kindly to mercy and left her alone with her lover horace seated himself in the vacant place on the sofa so far as it was in his nature to devote himself to any one he was devoted to mercy i am grieved to see how you have suffered he said with honest distress in his face as he looked at her try to forget what has happened i am trying to forget do you think of it much my darling it is too contemptible to be thought of she placed her work-basket on her lap her wasted fingers began absently sorting the wools inside have you seen mr julian gray she asked suddenly yes what does he say about it she looked at horace for the first time steadily scrutinizing his face horace took refuge in prevarication i really haven't asked for julian's opinion he said she looked down again with a sigh at the basket on her lap considered a little and tried him once more why has mr julian gray not been here for a whole week she went on the servants say he has been abroad is that true it was useless to deny it horace admitted that the servants were right her fingers suddenly stopped at their restless work among the wools her breath quickened perceptibly what had julian gray been doing abroad had he been making inquiries did he alone of all the people who saw that terrible meeting suspect her yes his was the finer intelligence his was a clergyman's a london clergyman's experience of frauds and deceptions and of the women who were guilty of them not a doubt of it now julian suspected her when does he come back she asked in tones so low that horace could barely hear her he has come back already he returned last night a faint shade of colour stole slowly over the pallor of her face she suddenly put her basket away and clasped her hands together to quiet the trembling of them before she asked her next question where is she paused to steady her voice 
where is the person she resumed who came here and frightened me horace hastened to reassure her the person will not come again he said don't talk of her don't think of her she shook her head there is something i want to know she persisted how did mr julian gray become acquainted with her this was easily answered horace mentioned the consul at mannheim and the letter of introduction she listened eagerly and said her next words in a louder firmer tone she was quite a stranger then to mr julian gray before that quite a stranger horace replied no more questions not another word about her grace i forbid the subject come my own love he said taking her hand and bending over her tenderly rally your spirits we are young we love each other now is our time to be happy her hand turned suddenly cold and trembled in his her head sank with a helpless weariness on her breast horace rose in alarm you are cold you are faint he said let me get you a glass of wine let me mend the fire the decanters were still on the luncheon table horace insisted on her drinking some port wine she barely took half the contents of the wine glass even that little told on her sensitive organization it roused her sinking energies of body and mind after watching her anxiously without attracting her notice horace left her again to attend to the fire at the other end of the room her eyes followed him slowly with a hard and tearless despair rally your spirits she repeated to herself in a whisper my spirits oh god she looked round her at the luxury and beauty of the room as those look who take their leave of familiar scenes the moment after her eyes sank and rested on the rich dress that she wore a gift from lady janet she thought of the past she thought of the future was the time near when she would be back again in the refuge or back again in the streets she who had been lady janet's adopted daughter and horace holmcroft's betrothed wife a sudden frenzy of recklessness seized on her as she thought of the coming end horace was right why not rally her spirits why not make the most of her time the last hours of her life in that house were at hand why not enjoy her stolen position while she could adventurous whispered the mocking spirit within her be true to your character away with your remorse remorse is the luxury of an honest woman she caught up her basket of wools inspired by a new idea ring the bell she cried out to horace at the fireplace he looked round in wonder the sound of her voice was so completely altered that he almost fancied there must have been another woman in the room ring the bell she repeated i have left my work upstairs if you want me to be in good spirits i must have my work still looking at her horace put his hand mechanically to the bell and rang one of the men servants came in go upstairs and ask my maid for my work she said sharply even the man was taken by surprise it was her habit to speak to the servants with a gentleness and consideration which had long since won all their hearts do you hear me she asked impatiently the servant bowed and went out on his errand she returned to horace with flashing eyes and fevered cheeks what a comfort it is she said to belong to the upper classes a poor woman has no maid to dress her and no footman to send upstairs is life worth having horace on less than five thousand a year the servant returned with a strip of embroidery she took it with an insolent grace and told him to bring her a footstool the man obeyed she tossed the embroidery away from her on the sofa on second thoughts i don't care about my work she said take it upstairs again the perfectly trained servant marvelling privately obeyed once more horace in silent astonishment advanced to the sofa to observe her more nearly how grave you look she exclaimed with an air of flippant unconcern you don't approve of my sitting idle perhaps anything to please you i haven't got to go up and downstairs ring the bell again my dear grace horace remonstrated gravely you are quite mistaken i never even thought of your work never mind it's inconsistent to send for my work and then send it away again ring the bell horace looked at her without moving 
grace he said what has come to you how should i know she retorted carelessly didn't you tell me to rally my spirits will you ring the bell or must i horace submitted he frowned as he walked back to the bell he was one of the many people who instinctively resent anything that is new to them this strange outbreak was quite new to him for the first time in his life he felt sympathy for a servant when the much enduring man appeared once more bring my work back i have changed my mind with that brief explanation she reclined luxuriously on the soft sofa cushions swinging one of her balls of wool to and fro above her head and looking at it lazily as she lay back i have a remark to make horace she went on when the door had closed on her messenger it is only people in our rank of life who get good servants did you notice nothing upsets that man's temper a servant in a poor family should have been impudent a maid of all work would have wondered when i was going to know my own mind the man returned with the embroidery this time she received him graciously she dismissed him with her thanks have you seen your mother lately horace she asked suddenly sitting up and busying herself with her work i saw her yesterday horace answered she understands i hope that i am not well enough to call on her she is not offended with me horace recovered his serenity the deference to his mother implied in mercy's questions gently flattered his self-esteem he resumed his place on the sofa offended with you he answered smiling my dear grace she sends you her love and more than that she has a wedding present for you mercy became absorbed in her work she stooped close over the embroidery so close that horace could not see her face do you know what the present is she asked in lowered tones speaking absently no i only know it is waiting for you shall i go and get it to-day she neither accepted nor refused the proposal she went on with her work more industriously than ever there is plenty of time horace persisted i can go before dinner still she took no notice still she never looked up your mother is very kind to me she said abruptly i was afraid at one time that she would think me hardly good enough to be your wife horace laughed indulgently his self-esteem was more gently flattered than ever absurd he exclaimed my darling you are connected with lady janet roy your family is almost as good as ours almost she repeated only almost the momentary levity of expression vanished from horace's face the family question was far too serious a question to be lightly treated a becoming shadow of solemnity stole over his manner he looked as if it was sunday and he was just stepping into church in our family he said we trace back by my father to the saxons by my mother to the normans lady janet's family is an old family on her side only mercy dropped her embroidery and looked horace full in the face she too attached no common importance to what she had next to say if i had not been connected with lady janet she began would you ever have thought of marrying me my love what is the use of asking you are connected with lady janet she refused to let him escape answering her in that way suppose i had not been connected with lady janet she persisted suppose i had only been a good girl with nothing but my own merits to speak for me what would your mother have said then horace still parried the question only to find the point of it pressed home on him once more why do you ask he said i ask to be answered she rejoined would your mother have liked you to marry a poor girl of no family with nothing but her own virtues to speak for her horace was fairly pressed back to the wall if you must know he replied my mother would have refused to sanction such a marriage as that no matter how good the girl might have been there was something defiant almost threatening in her tone horace was annoyed and he showed it when he spoke my mother would have respected the girl without ceasing to respect herself he said my mother would have remembered what was due to the family name and she would have said no she would have said no ah 
there was an undertone of angry contempt in the exclamation which made horace start what is the matter he asked nothing she answered and took up her embroidery again there he sat at her side anxiously looking at her his hope in the future centred in his marriage in a week more if she chose she might enter that ancient family of which he had spoken so proudly as his wife oh she thought if i didn't love him if i had only his merciless mother to think of uneasily conscious of some estrangement between them horace spoke again surely i have not offended you he said she turned toward him once more the work dropped unheeded on her lap her grand eyes softened into tenderness a smile trembled sadly on her delicate lips she laid one hand caressingly on his shoulder all the beauty of her voice lent its charm to the next words that she said to him the woman's heart hungered in its misery for the comfort that could only come from his lips you would have loved me horace without stopping to think of the family name the family name again how strangely she persisted in coming back to that horace looked at her without answering trying vainly to fathom what was passing in her mind she took his hand and wrung it hard as if she would wring the answer out of him in that way you would have loved me she repeated the double spell of her voice and her touch was on him he answered warmly under any circumstances under any name she put one arm round his neck and fixed her eyes on his is that true she asked true as the heaven above us she drank in those few commonplace words with a greedy delight she forced him to repeat them in a new form no matter who i might have been for myself alone for yourself alone she threw both arms round him and laid her head passionately on his breast i love you i love you i love you her voice rose with hysterical vehemence at each repetition of the words then suddenly sank to a low hoarse cry of rage and despair the sense of her true position toward him revealed itself in all its horror as the confession of her love escaped her lips her arms dropped from him she flung herself back on the sofa cushions hiding her face in her hands oh leave me she moaned faintly go go horace tried to wind his arm round her and raise her she started to her feet and waved him back from her with a wild action of her hands as if she was frightened of him the wedding present she cried seizing the first pretext that occurred to her you offered to bring me your mother's present i am dying to see what it is go and get it horace tried to compose her he might as well have tried to compose the winds and the sea go she repeated pressing one clenched hand on her bosom i am not well talking excites me i am hysterical i shall be better alone get me the present go shall i send lady janet shall i ring for your maid send for nobody ring for nobody if you love me leave me here by myself leave me instantly i shall see you when i come back yes yes there was no alternative but to obey her unwillingly and forebodingly horace left the room she drew a deep breath of relief and dropped into the nearest chair if horace had stayed a moment longer she felt it she knew it her head would have given way she would have burst out before him with the terrible truth oh she thought pressing her cold hands on her burning eyes if i could only cry now there is nobody to see me the room was empty she had every reason for concluding that she was alone and yet at that very moment there were ears that listened there were eyes waiting to see her little by little the door behind her which faced the library and led into the billiard room was opened noiselessly from without by an inch at a time as the opening was enlarged a hand in a black glove an arm in a black sleeve appeared guiding the movement of the door 
an interval of a moment passed and the worn white face of grace roseberry showed itself stealthily looking into the dining-room her eyes brightened with a vindictive pleasure as they discovered mercy sitting alone at the further end of the room inch by inch she opened the door more widely took one step forward and checked herself a sound just audible at the far end of the conservatory had caught her ear she listened satisfied herself that she was not mistaken and drawing back with a frown of displeasure softly closed the door again so as to hide herself from view the sound that had disturbed her was the distant murmur of men's voices apparently two in number talking together in lowered tones at the garden entrance to the conservatory who were the men and what would they do next they might do one of two things they might enter the drawing-room or they might withdraw again by way of the garden kneeling behind the door with her ear at the keyhole grace roseberry waited the event end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the new magdalen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the new magdalen by wilkie collins chapter sixteen they meet again absorbed in herself mercy failed to notice the opening door or to hear the murmur of voices in the conservatory the one terrible necessity which had been present to her mind at intervals for a week past was confronting her at that moment she owed to grace roseberry the tardy justice of owning the truth the longer her confession was delayed the more cruelly she was injuring the woman whom she had robbed of her identity the friendless woman who had neither witnesses nor papers to produce who was powerless to right her own wrong keenly as she felt this mercy failed nevertheless to conquer the horror that shook her when she thought of the impending avowal day followed day and still she shrank from the unendurable ordeal of confession as she was shrinking from it now was it fear for herself that closed her lips she trembled as any human being in her place must have trembled at the bare idea of finding herself thrown back again on the world which had no place in it and no hope in it for her but she could have overcome that terror she could have resigned herself to that doom no it was not the fear of the confession itself or the fear of the consequences which must follow it that still held her silent the horror that daunted her was the horror of owning to horace and to lady janet that she had cheated them out of their love every day lady janet was kinder and kinder every day horace was fonder and fonder of her how could she confess to lady janet how could she own to horace that she had imposed upon him i can't do it they are so good to me i can't do it in that hopeless way it had ended during the seven days that had gone by in that hopeless way it ended again now the murmur of the two voices at the further end of the conservatory ceased the billiard-room door opened again slowly by an inch at a time mercy still kept her place unconscious of the events that were passing round her sinking under the hard stress laid on it her mind had drifted little by little into a new train of thought for the first time she found the courage to question the future in a new way supposing her confession to have been made or supposing the woman whom she had personated to have discovered the means of exposing the fraud what advantage she now asked herself would miss roseberry derive from mercy merrick's disgrace could lady janet transfer to the woman who was really her relative by marriage the affection which she had given to the woman who had pretended to be her relative no all the right in the world would not put the true grace into the false grace's vacant place the qualities by which mercy had won lady janet's love were the qualities which were mercy's own 
lady janet could do rigid justice but hers was not the heart to give itself to a stranger and to give itself unreservedly a second time grace roseberry would be formally acknowledged and there it would end was there hope in this new view yes there was the false hope of making the inevitable atonement by some other means than by the confession of the fraud what had grace roseberry actually lost by the wrong done to her she had lost the salary of lady janet's companion and reader say that she wanted money mercy had her savings from the generous allowance made to her by lady janet mercy could offer money or say that she wanted employment mercy's interest with lady janet could offer employment could offer anything grace might ask for if she would only come to terms invigorated by the new hope mercy rose excitedly weary of inaction in the empty room she who but a few minutes since had shuddered at the thought of their meeting again was now eager to devise a means of finding her way privately to an interview with grace it should be done without loss of time on that very day if possible by the next day at latest she looked round her mechanically pondering how to reach the end in view her eyes rested by chance on the door of the billiard-room was it fancy or did she really see the door first open a little then suddenly and softly close again was it fancy or did she really hear at the same moment a sound behind her as of persons speaking in the conservatory she paused and looking back in that direction listened intently the sound if she had really heard it was no longer audible she advanced towards the billiard-room to set her first doubt at rest she stretched out her hand to open the door when the voices recognizable now as the voices of two men caught her ear once more this time she was able to distinguish the words that were spoken any further orders sir inquired one of the men nothing more replied the other mercy started and faintly flushed as the second voice answered the first she stood irresolute close to the billiard-room hesitating what to do next after an interval the second voice made itself heard again advancing nearer to the dining-room are you there aunt it asked cautiously there was a moment's pause then the voice spoke for the third time sounding louder and nearer are you there it reiterated i have something to tell you mercy summoned her resolution and answered lady janet is not here she turned as she spoke toward the conservatory door and confronted on the threshold julian gray they looked at one another without exchanging a word on either side the situation for widely different reasons was equally embarrassing to both of them there as julian saw her was the woman forbidden to him the woman whom he loved there as mercy saw him was the man whom she dreaded the man whose actions as she interpreted them proved that he suspected her on the surface of it the incidents which had marked their first meeting were now exactly repeated with the one difference that the impulse to withdraw this time appeared to be on the man's side and not on the woman's it was mercy who spoke first did you expect to find lady janet here she asked constrainedly he answered on his part more constrainedly still it doesn't matter he said another time will do he drew back as he made the reply she advanced desperately with the deliberate intention of detaining him by speaking again the attempt which he had made to withdraw the constraint in his manner when he had answered had instantly confirmed her in the false conviction that he and he alone had guessed the truth if she was right if he had secretly made discoveries abroad which placed her entirely at his mercy the attempt to induce grace to consent to a compromise with her would be manifestly useless her first and foremost interest now was to find out how she really stood in the estimation of julian gray in a terror of suspense that turned her cold from head to foot she stopped him on his way out and spoke to him with the piteous counterfeit of a smile lady janet is receiving some visitors she said if you will wait here she will be back directly 
the effort of hiding her agitation from him had brought a passing colour into her cheeks worn and wasted as she was the spell of her beauty was strong enough to hold him against his own will all he had to tell lady janet was that he had met one of the gardeners in the conservatory and had cautioned him as well as the lodge-keeper it would have been easy to write this and to send the note to his aunt on quitting the house for the sake of his own peace of mind for the sake of his duty to horace he was doubly bound to make the first polite excuse that occurred to him and to leave her as he had found her alone in the room he made the attempt and hesitated despising himself for doing it he allowed himself to look at her their eyes met julian stepped into the dining-room if i am not in the way he said confusedly i will wait as you kindly propose she noticed his embarrassment she saw that he was strongly restraining himself from looking at her again her own eyes dropped to the ground as she made the discovery her speech failed her her heart throbbed faster and faster if i look at him again was the thought in her mind i shall fall at his feet and tell him all that i have done if i look at her again was the thought in his mind i shall fall at her feet and own that i am in love with her with downcast eyes he placed a chair for her with downcast eyes she bowed to him and took it a dead silence followed never was any human misunderstanding more intricately complete than the misunderstanding which had now established itself between those two mercy's work-basket was near her she took it and gained time for composing herself by pretending to arrange the coloured wools he stood behind her chair looking at the graceful turn of her head looking at the rich masses of her hair he reviled himself as the weakest of men as the falsest of friends for still remaining near her and yet he remained the silence continued the billiard-room door opened again noiselessly the face of the listening woman appeared stealthily behind it at the same moment mercy roused herself and spoke won't you sit down she said softly still not looking round at him still busy with her basket of wools he turned to get a chair turned so quickly that he saw the billiard-room door move as grace roseberry closed it again is there any one in that room he asked addressing mercy i don't know she answered i thought i saw the door open and shut again a little while ago he advanced at once to look into the room as he did so mercy dropped one of her balls of wool he stopped to pick it up for her then threw open the door and looked into the billiard room it was empty had some person been listening and had that person retreated in time to escape discovery the open door of the smoking-room showed that room also to be empty a third door was open the door of the side hall leading into the grounds julian closed and locked it and returned to the dining-room i can only suppose he said to mercy that the billiard-room door was not properly shut and that the draught of air from the hall must have moved it she accepted the explanation in silence he was to all appearance not quite satisfied with it himself for a moment or two he looked about him uneasily then the old fascination fastened its hold on him again once more he looked at the graceful turn of her head at the rich masses of her hair the courage to put the critical question to him now that she had lured him into remaining in the room was still a courage that failed her she remained as busy as ever with her work too busy to look at him too busy to speak to him the silence became unendurable he broke it by making a commonplace inquiry after her health i am well enough to be ashamed of the anxiety i have caused and the trouble i have given she answered to-day i have got downstairs for the first time i am trying to do a little work she looked into the basket the various specimens of wool in it were partly in balls and partly in loose skeins the skeins were mixed and tangled here is sad confusion she exclaimed timidly with a faint smile how am i to set it right again let me help you said julian you why not he asked with a momentary return of the quaint humour which she remembered so well 
you forget that i am a curate curates are privileged to make themselves useful to young ladies let me try he took a stool at her feet and set himself to unravel one of the tangled skeins in a minute the wool was stretched on his hands and the loose end was ready for mercy to wind there was something in the trivial action and in the homely attention that it implied which in some degree quieted her fear of him she began to roll the wool off his hands into a ball thus occupied she said the daring words which were to lead him little by little into betraying his suspicions if he did indeed suspect the truth End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the new magdalen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the new magdalen by wilkie collins chapter seventeen the guardian angel you were here when i fainted were you not mercy began you must think me a sad coward even for a woman he shook his head i am far from thinking that he replied no courage could have sustained the shock which fell on you i don't wonder that you fainted i don't wonder that you have been ill she paused in rolling up the ball of wool what did those words of unexpected sympathy mean was he laying a trap for her urged by that serious doubt she questioned him more boldly horace tells me you have been abroad she said did you enjoy your holiday it was no holiday i went abroad because i thought it right to make certain inquiries he stopped there unwilling to return to a subject that was painful to her her voice sank her fingers trembled round the ball of wool but she managed to go on did you arrive at any results she asked at no results worth mentioning the caution of that reply renewed her worst suspicions of him in sheer despair she spoke out plainly i want to know your opinion she began gently said julian you are entangling the wool again i want to know your opinion of the person who so terribly frightened me do you think her do i think her what do you think her an adventuress as she said those words the branches of a shrub in the conservatory were noiselessly parted by a hand in a black glove the face of grace roseberry appeared dimly behind the leaves undiscovered she had escaped from the billiard room and had stolen her way into the conservatory as the safer hiding place of the two behind the shrub she could see as well as listen behind the shrub she waited as patiently as ever i take a more merciful view julian answered i believe she is acting under a delusion i don't blame her i pity her you pity her as mercy repeated the words she tore off julian's hands the last few lengths of wool left and threw the imperfectly wound skein back into the basket does that mean she resumed abruptly that you believe her julian rose from his seat and looked at mercy in astonishment good heavens miss roseberry what put such an idea as that into your head i am little better than a stranger to you she rejoined with an effort to assume a jesting tone you met that person before you met with me it is not so very far from pitying her to believing her how could i feel sure that you might not suspect me suspect you he exclaimed you don't know how you distress how you shock me suspect you the bare idea of it never entered my mind a man doesn't live who trusts you more implicitly who believes in you more devotedly than i do his eyes his voice his manner all told her that those words came from the heart she contrasted his generous confidence in her the confidence of which she was unworthy with her ungracious distrust of him not only had she wronged grace roseberry she had wronged julian gray could she deceive him as she had deceived the others could she meanly accept that implicit trust that devoted belief never had she felt the base submissions which her own imposture condemned her to undergo with a loathing of them so overwhelming as the loathing that she felt now 
In horror of herself, she turned her head aside in silence and shrank from meeting his eye. He noticed the movement, placing his own interpretation on it. Advancing closer, he asked anxiously if he had offended her. "'You don't know how your confidence touches me,' she said without looking up. "'You little think how keenly I feel your kindness.' She checked herself abruptly. Her fine tact warned her that she was speaking too warmly, that the expression of her gratitude might strike him as being strangely exaggerated. She handed him her work-basket before he could speak again. "'Will you put it away from me?' she asked in her quieter tones. "'I don't feel able to work just now.' His back was turned on her for a moment while he placed the basket on a side-table. In that moment her mind advanced at a bound from present to future. Accident might one day put the true grace in possession of the proofs that she needed, and might reveal the false grace to him in the identity that was her own. What would he think of her then? Could she make him tell her without betraying herself? She determined to try. Children are notoriously insatiable if you once answer their questions, and women are just as bad, she said when Julian returned to her. Will your patience hold out if I go back for the third time to the person whom we have been speaking of? Try me, he answered with a smile. Suppose you had not taken your merciful view of her. Yes. Suppose you believed that she was wickedly bent on deceiving others for a purpose of her own. Would you not shrink from such a woman in horror and disgust? God forbid that I would shrink from any human creature, he answered earnestly. Who among us has a right to do that? She hardly dared trust herself to believe him. You would still pity her? she persisted, and still feel for her? With all my heart. Oh, how good you are! He held up his hand in warning. The tones of his voice deepened, the luster in his eyes brightened. She had stirred in the depths of that great heart the faith in which the man lived, the steady principle which guided his modest and noble life. No, he cried, don't say that. Say that I try to love my neighbor as myself. Who but a Pharisee can believe that he is better than another? The best among us today may, but for the mercy of God, be the worst among us tomorrow. The true Christian virtue is the virtue which never despairs of a fellow creature. The true Christian faith believes in man as well as in God. Frail and fallen as we are, we can rise on the wings of repentance from earth to heaven. Humanity is sacred. Humanity has its immortal destiny. Who shall dare say to man or woman, There is no hope in you? Who shall dare say the work is all vile, when that work bears on it the stamp of the Creator's hand? He turned away for a moment, struggling with the emotion which he had roused in him. Her eyes, as they followed him, lighted with a momentary enthusiasm, then sank wearily in the vain regret which comes too late. Ah! If he could have been her friend and her adviser on the fatal day when she first turned her steps towards Mablethorpe House. She sighed bitterly as the hopeless aspiration wrung her heart. He heard the sigh, and, turning again, looked at her with a new interest in his face. "'Miss Roseberry?' he said. She was still absorbed in the bitter memories of the past. She failed to hear him. "'Miss Roseberry,' he repeated, approaching her. She looked up at him with a start. "'May I venture to ask you something?' he said, gently. She shrank at the question. "'Don't suppose I am speaking out of mere curiosity,' he went on. "'And pray don't answer me, unless you can answer without betraying any confidence which may have been placed in you.' "'Confidence?' she repeated. "'What confidence do you mean?' It has just struck me that you might have felt more than a common interest in the questions which you put to me a moment since, he answered. Were you by any chance speaking of some unhappy woman, not the person who frightened you, of course, but of some other woman whom you know? Her head sank slowly on her bosom. He had plainly no suspicion that she had been speaking of herself. His tone and manner both answered for it that his belief in her was as strong as ever. Still, those last words made her tremble. She could not trust herself to reply to them. He accepted the bending of her head as a reply. "'Are you interested in her?' he asked next. She faintly answered this time. "'Yes.' "'Have you encouraged her?' 
I have not dared to encourage her. His face lighted up suddenly with enthusiasm. Go to her, he said, and let me go with you and help you. The answer came faintly and mournfully. She has sunk too low for that. He interrupted her with a gesture of impatience. What has she done? he asked. She has deceived, basely deceived, innocent people who trusted her. She has wronged, cruelly wronged, another woman. For the first time Julian seated himself at her side. The interest that was now roused in him was an interest above reproach. He could speak to Mercy without restraint. He could look at Mercy with a pure heart. "'You judge her very harshly,' he said. "'Do you know how she may have been tried and tempted?' There was no answer. "'Tell me,' he went on, "'is the person whom she has injured still living?' "'Yes.' "'If the person is still living, she may atone for the wrong. "'The time may come when this sinner, too, "'may win our pardon and deserve our respect.' "'Could you respect her?' Mercy asked, sadly. "'Can such a mind as yours understand what she has gone through?' A smile, kind and momentary, brightened his attentive face. "'You forget my melancholy experience,' he answered. "'Young as I am, I have seen more than most men of women who have sinned and suffered. "'Even after that little that you have told me, I think I can put myself in her place.' I can well understand, for instance, that she may have been tempted beyond human resistance. Am I right? You are right. She may have had nobody near at the time to advise her, to warn her, to save her. Is that true? It is true. Tempted and friendless, self-abandoned to the evil impulse of the moment, this woman may have committed herself headlong to the act which she now vainly repents. She may long to make atonement, and may not know how to begin. All her energies may be crushed under the despair and horror of herself, out of which the truest repentance grows. Is such a woman as this all wicked, all vile? I deny it. She may have a noble nature, and she may show it nobly yet. Give her the opportunity she needs, and our poor, fallen fellow-creature may take her place again among the best of us, honored, blameless, happy once more. Mercy's eyes, resting eagerly on him while he was speaking, dropped again despondently when he had done. "'There is no such future as that,' she answered, "'for the woman whom I am thinking of. She has lost her opportunity. She has done with hope.' Julian gravely considered with himself for a moment. "'Let us understand each other,' he said. She has committed an act of deception to the injury of another woman. Was that what you told me? Yes. And she has gained something to her own advantage by the act? Yes. Is she threatened with discovery? She is safe from discovery, for the present at least. Safe as long as she closes her lips? As long as she closes her lips. There is her opportunity, cried Julian. Her future is before her. She has not done with hope. With clasped hands, in breathless suspense, Mercy looked at that inspiriting face, and listened to those golden words. Explain yourself, she said. Tell her, through me, what she must do. Let her own the truth, answered Julian, without the base fear of discovery to drive her to it. Let her do justice to the woman whom she has wronged, while that woman is still powerless to expose her. Let her sacrifice everything that she has gained by the fraud to the sacred duty of atonement. If she can do that, for conscience' sake, and for pity's sake, to her own prejudice, to her own shame, to her own loss, then her repentance has nobly revealed the noble nature that is in her. Then she is a woman to be trusted, respected, beloved. If I saw the Pharisees and fanatics of this lower earth passing her by in contempt, I would hold out my hand to her before them all. I would say to her in her solitude and her affliction, Rise, poor wounded heart, beautiful purified soul, God's angels rejoice over you. Take your place among the noblest of God's creatures. In those last sentences he unconsciously repeated the language in which he had spoken, years since, to his congregation in the chapel of the refuge. With tenfold power and tenfold persuasion they now found their way again to Mercy's heart. Softly, 
Suddenly, mysteriously, a change passed over her. Her troubled face grew beautifully still. The shifting light of terror and suspense vanished from her grand gray eyes, and left in them the steady inner glow of a high and pure resolve. There was a moment of silence between them. They both had need of silence. Julian was the first to speak again. "'Have I satisfied you that her opportunity is still before her?' he asked. "'Do you feel, as I feel, that she has not done with hope?' "'You have satisfied me that the world holds no truer friend to her than you,' Mercy answered, gently and gratefully. "'She shall prove herself worthy of your generous confidence in her. "'She shall show you yet that you have not spoken in vain.' Still inevitably failing to understand her, he led the way to the door. "'Don't waste the precious time,' he said. "'Don't leave her cruelly to herself. "'If you can't go to her, let me go as your messenger in your place.' She stopped him by a gesture. He took a step back into the room and paused, observing with surprise that she made no attempt to move from the chair that she occupied. "'Stay here,' she said to him in suddenly altered tones. "'Pardon me?' he rejoined, I don't understand you. You will understand me directly. Give me a little time. He still lingered near the door, with his eyes fixed inquiringly on her. A man of a lower nature than his, or a man believing in mercy less devotedly than he believed, would now have felt his first suspicion of her. Julian was as far as ever from suspecting her, even yet. Do you wish to be alone? he asked considerately. Shall I leave you for a while and return again? She looked up with a start of terror. Leave me, she repeated, and suddenly checked herself on the point of saying more. Nearly half the length of the room divided them from each other. The words which she was longing to say were words that would never pass her lips, unless she could see some encouragement in his face. No, she cried out to him on a sudden, in her sore need. Don't leave me. Come back to me. He obeyed her in silence. In silence, on her side, she pointed to the chair near her. He took it. She looked at him, and checked herself again, resolute to make her terrible confession, yet still hesitating how to begin. Her woman's instinct whispered to her, Find courage in his touch. She said to him, simply and artlessly said to him, Give me encouragement. Give me strength. Let me take your hand. He neither answered nor moved. His mind seemed to have become suddenly preoccupied. His eyes rested on her vacantly. He was on the brink of discovering her secret. In another instant he would have found his way to the truth. In that instant, innocently, as his sister would have taken it, she took his hand. The soft clasp of her fingers, clinging round his, roused his senses, fired his passion for her, swept out of his mind the pure aspiration which had filled it but the moment before, paralyzed his perception when it was just penetrating the mystery of her disturbed manner and her strange words. All the man in him trembled under the rapture of her touch. But the thought of Horace was still present in him. His hand lay passive in hers. His eyes looked not easily away from her. She innocently strengthened her clasp of his hand. She innocently said to him, Don't look away from me. Your eyes give me courage. His hand returned the pressure of hers. He tasted to the full the delicious joy of looking at her. She had broken down his last reserves of self-control. The thought of Horace, the sense of honor, became obscured in him. In a moment more he might have said the words which he would have deplored for the rest of his life, had she not stopped him by speaking first. "'I have more to say to you,' she resumed abruptly, feeling the animating resolution to lay her heart bare before him at last. "'More, far more than I have said yet.' "'Generous, merciful friend, let me say it here.' She attempted to throw herself on her knees at his feet. He sprung from his seat and checked her, holding her with both his hands, raising her as he rose himself. In the words which had just escaped her, in the startling action which had accompanied them, the truth burst on him. The guilty woman she had spoken of was herself. While she was almost in his arms, while her bosom was just touching his, before a word more had passed his lips or hers, the library door opened. Lady Janet Roy entered the room. End of chapter 17 Recording by Todd